Welcome to the problem solving and programming language series. Problem solving. When do we use computers to solve our problems nowadays? So basically, programming being used to kind of teach how to solve those problems. In this entire course, we will learn how to use computers and solve problems by writing programs. So we will start slowly and when we on in this course uh, to, the, to solve deep problems. Course information, as I mentioned, the objective of the course to solve problems. So in order to solve problems, we use computers. In order to teach computers, we use programs. Programs will basically tell the computer how to solve the problem, then computer will solve it. So entire course is about knowledge, concepts of problem solving, and to improve programming skills uh, on those areas. So in the first lecture, I will divide into three parts. In the first part, I give a brief introduction to computers and flowcharts. The flowcharts are the basic tool we use to solve problems. And then I will introduce different programming paradigms, the way we write programs from the history to right now. And then I will introduce the C programming language. The C is the tool or the programming language we use in this course uh, to solve uh, problems. So I use two books as references. Uh, so first one is uh, programming language, the C programming language, it's a very old book. And the other one, C programming. Both books are kind of very old. C is uh, the old, kind of oldest programming language in the world. So I use those old books to teach you problem solving. As I mentioned, the objective of this course is not to teach you C, to teach you how to solve problems. For that, we use mainly C. Before I start the course, I would like to discuss a little bit about computers. So computers are basically machines. So they consist of, you know, transistors, ICs, and so many electronic components. And when you want to kind of use those computers to solve a problem, we have to instruct those machines how to do that. Also, computers are capable of storing some data and execute the instruction on top of this data. So, and finally, computers might display data. However, we have to tell the computers everything what you need to do. So basic computer architecture is look like this. It has a memory, control unit, arithmetic and logic unit, and input outputs. Basically, we give the inputs mainly through the keyboard, or maybe through mouse, joysticks, and those inputs read it by the computer and process it and displays the results. Results displays onto the output unit. So we give the inputs to the computers and then finally we get output from the computer. So most of the inputs, you know, we give to the computer using keyboards. Or well, most of the time we display our output on the screen or the monitor. 
So in addition to the monitor, we might have different outputs devices like printers. So inside the computer, there are three major components. They are memory, control unit, and arithmetic and logic unit. Memory is used to store the data. So whatever we type in the input unit will store in the memory. So then we have control unit. Control units process the data which is stored in the memory. So for that, in the control unit, there might be subcomponents, what you call it as registers, program counters, and so on. I'm not going into such thing. So control unit basically fetch the data and instructions stored in the memory and process this. In order to process this, computers get help from the arithmetic and logic unit. So arithmetic and logic unit access the data, which is fetched by the control unit, data and instruction, and execute them and store the results of the memory. And then the results stored in the memory would be displayed in the output unit. So that's how basic computer or the machine works. So the very basic view of computer is called one Newman shared memory architecture. So in this computer architecture, we have, as I mentioned, we have input output, CPU, and the memory. CPU consists of, as I said, arithmetic and logic unit, and other, other units which flash at the end so instructions temporarily. So in between CPU and memory, communication goes through the internal communication buses, what we call it as communication links. So everything happens today in the computer. Basically, at very abstract level, it's something look like this. So when you go into the detail of the memory, memory has different cells. So each cell has what we call it as address. So as you know, if you want to send a letter to our home. Each home in the world need to have an address. So similarly, if you want to send the data and fetch the data from the memory, each memory should have an address. So that call it as memory address. So there are different methods of addressing those memory cells, or what you call units, which we use to store the data plus our programs, instructions, programs with instructions. CPU fetch the instructions, and then they fetch the data which related to those instructions, and process those data according to the instructions, and store the results back in the memory. So that's how CPU and the memory works together. So in the very low level, if you want to do that, we can do it in a programming language called assembly, We'll discuss later on. However, nowadays we are handling the computers in very high level. So when you look at the architecture or the layers of the modern computers, it's something look like that. We have in the law level, we have this hardware, what we discussed so far. They have they consist of input outputs, like outputs units are monitors, input units are keyboards printers like and mouse and our data and whatever we store in the memories there are different types of memories available and then on top of that there is a simple subroutines written what we call basic input output systems bios this bios is a simple instructions which uh, uh, stored on this hardware to access those inputs, outputs, and the memory. So on top of the bio, BIOS, people have developed some programs, what we call it as operating systems. Operating systems consist of the instructions to handle the entire computer, computer you know, it, on, on behalf of us. So as you know, in the computers can process one instruction at the time sequentially, 
there are several devices connected to that. So we need to simultaneously manage those. So operating system will do housekeeping part of a computer. So they will basically uh, handle the low level, or they, they will hide the low level part from us. So on top of the operating systems, we can run our applications. So multiple applications can run parallelly as well as concurrently. So those applications basically talk to the operating system. Operating systems talk to the BIOS and finally hardware to be serve our tasks. As I mentioned, computers are machines. So they don't know anything about unless otherwise we tell them how to do that. So in this course, we will learn how to give the instruction properly to solve problems. So computers we use to solve problems. Maybe it's a simple problem or maybe it's a complicated problems. So all simple or complicated problems, we must instruct the computers how to do that. So in the basic tools, what we, we, we use different basic tools to do it. So flowcharts are one of the very simple tool we use uh, to build or to organize our instructions. So after we kind of organize those instructions using these uh, flowcharts or different tools, so we then write, need to write uh, instructions, uh, uh, kind of we, match, we need to match those instructions uh, to those tools where finally we can build our program. Basically, what does computer do? The computer perform calculations and then remember the results. So that's what they do. Or in other words, in general terms, we can tell computers to process the data and store the results. So with the modern computers can process billions of calculations or billions of data per second. And they can remember gigabytes of storage or gigabytes of data in their memories plus added storages like hard disks or external storages. What kind of calculations they do? They, they have built-in instructions. They can do these calculations based on those printing instructions. And we can give the instructions to the computers by using their basic instructions. So whatever the computer do is the instructions given to the computers by a program. So the programmer is the powerful person who basically pass the instruction to the computer. Computers are the machines which basically execute those instructions. So we have to understand what we call it as computer science as well. So some people think computer science is a computer. It's similar to like some people think astronomy is about telescope. So as you know, astronomy is a very huge subject. Telescope is a tool which you use in, to study the astronomy. Similarly, computer science is no more about computers. Computer science is a huge subject about solving problems. So computers are the tools we use to use in this computer science field. Computer is not a computer science. Computer science is about algorithms. Computer science is about algorithms. Algorithms are the formal specification for starting a method to solve a problem. So algorithms specifies the way to solve the problems. So then the specification can convert it to the instructions using a programming language. After that, computer can execute those. So basically what you should understand is the computer is a tool. Computer science is all about solving problems. 
using algorithms. As I mentioned, algorithm is the formulas or the recipes or step-by-step -step procedures which computer need to follow to solve the problems. To be useful as a basis for writing a program, algorithm must arrive at co correct solution within a finite time. So when you execute or whatever this algorithm, when you draw algorithm, so it should reach the solution in a finite time. That means real time, kind of, not real time, it's kind of a given time. If they cannot solve the problem and it may take astronomical years to solve the problem, your algorithm is not practical. So we need to build algorithm which reach to the solution in a finite time. Similarly, it should be clear, precise, and, and ambiguous. Because if it is not precise, so we couldn't basically build instructions or we couldn't convert this algorithm to the code. So if we write our algorithm in clear, simple, precise, and ambiguous ways, then we could convert it into the programs using any programming language. So the programming language are the tools which we use to give instruction to the computers. So we'll, we build programs using programming language. Algorithms helps us to write programs. Or in other words, we have a solid problem to solve. So we develop algorithms to solve this problem. And then look, by looking at these algorithms, we basically develop programs. So then computers can understand these programs and execute those in their machines. And finally, we get the result. In order to build algorithms, there are three basic constructions, constructors we use. So they are called as sequence, iterations, and the selections. By, see, by using these three, we could solve almost all the problems which we face day to day in computer science. Sequence are the sequence of instructions execute one after other. Iterations are a repetition of same sequence one or more times. When we do iterations in computer programming, we call it as loops. So there are several ways of writing loops. We call it as for loops, while loops, repeat until loops, and so on. We will learn that when, it, when we move on. The other major part of the uh, control structures in the algorithms are selections. Selections will select one part of the sequence. So for example, so there might be sequence of instructions it should be executed up, which satisfy after some conditions. So for example, if a value is less than some, your variable is less than some value, perhaps we, we want to execute some set of instruction. If your variable is greater than some value, we want to do some other set of instructions or other set of sequence. So which set will execute at what time will decide on the selection. The, by the way, variables we use to access the memory cells. Variables are used to access the memory cells. They will come to later on. So they can be used to store the data in the algorithms. All the problems, basic problems we solve using sequence, iterations, and selections. So as I said, very fundamental tool we use to build algorithms are flowcharts. So there are six fundamental symbols we use to construct those flowcharts. So the execution of algorithm, we start with the start symbol, and the algorithm should stop when it reaches the stop symbol. 
So we give the inputs to the algorithm using this input symbol and the output of the algorithm reach using the output symbol. So then the sequence of instructions execute under this process and then decision will take using the symbol. Using the process and decisions, we can create iterations or what we call it as loops. So using these six basic symbols, we could solve a lot of problems. Or we can draw a flowchart to solve problem. In other words, using these six symbols, we can draw flowcharts to solve problems. The flowcharts, it's a kind of algorithms. Flowchart is the basic tools which represent or kind of uh, draw or visualize the algorithm. The visualize is the best term. Flowcharts visualize our algorithm. Right, without talking too much, let's take simple problems one by one and draw flowcharts and maybe write codes. So in order to write that simple code, I am using programming language, or what we call it as visual programming language, called Scratch. So maybe you are in school. Some of your IT teacher in school introduce you the Scratch. So now you are in the university, but Scratch is still useful to understand this algorithm, so the flowcharts. So before I'm moving into the programming language like C, why not we have a look on Scratch and solve a set of simple problems to understand sequence, iterations, and selections. So then it's, it will be easy to move on to the real life program. So the first problem I want to look at is just printing your name on the terminal. So all the programming language, it's usually call it as hello world problem. So we just start our program. It might say hello to you and then it stop. So in this program, there are no inputs. It has a start symbol, flowchart symbol, no inputs, but it has an output. Output is print your name. After print your name, it is stop. So there are only three stages in this flowchart. Start, print name, stop. So there are three symbols in flowcharts to represent that. So this is a simple algorithm to write your name on the terminal. So this algorithm can be converted into a program using a different programming language. So as a simple, simplicity, since because I want to use a very simple programming language to visualize this idea, I use Scratch to do it. So those who don't know about Scratch can learn Scratch at the beginning before moving into C. Scratch will tell you very simply how these sequence, controls, repetitions, conditions, variables, or those important components of the programming language in very simple terms. So you can download and install Scratch in your local machine, use, or you can run Scratch online. So the main website for the Scratch is Scratch MIT EDU. So using that, we can write our own programs and see how it works. So let's use that and then write our, convert our simple uh, uh, algorithm that is print name. So it, it start, print, stop using Scratch. So I go to the Scratch website illustrate it. So after you visit Scratch, you say create. 
So I'm using Scratch online tool instead of installing it. If you have a browser, you can do it. You don't need anything else to do Scratch. Only the browser and the internet connection. Right, so Scratch has several visualized coding blocks. Scratch is a visual programming language. There are no kind of textual instructions. Instead of, they have simple building blocks which are we can use to build programs. So we have a simple program which print our name on the terminal. So it has three steps, star, print name, stop. So first of all, we need to kind of start it. Start our, start our problem. For that, Scratch has some tool. We call event tool, event, and event. So we, we press event and we take this event tool here. So it says when click this flag, start the program. So that's how simple scratch program start. So that is our start flow chart. So then we need to finally stop that program. So for that we need to get stopped. Uh, so they are we need to find stop. So let's see. This stop. Stop all will stop the program, all actions of the program. So then we have start and stop. So after that, what we have to say hello or print our name. So for that, we need to uh, print it. On the terminal. So there are different kind of outputs in the scratch, what we call loops. So there I will use this loop. So if I want to execute that, I have to put in between that. Then if I want to print my name, I say say password for two seconds. So that's my my simple program. It says start. Say person for two seconds and so. So in the scratch, there are no terminal, even though I can say terminal. Our terminal is this cat. The, this cat is works based on our instructions. This cat executes our instructions and behaves the way we I tell to behave. So what in this simple algorithm, I want, to, that I want to tell this cat to say hello for us. So for that I say start, say, say hello or say cousin, and then stop. So these are the three, three instructions. So then in order to start execution, I click this flag. So you say the cat say hello. So that's it. So if I want to, uh, say, uh, say hello, cousin. So before cat say cousin, now I want to learn, teach the cat to tell hello, cousin. So there, I could say hello, cousin here in this looks or what we call output. So then I execute that. Now you see the cat says hello, cousin. So that's it. That is our simple first program. Right. Now, let's take, this is our simple first program. Start, say hello, person, and stop. Right. Now, try to write a program to read your name and print it on the terminal. Or in other words, if you use scratch to do that, teach this cat, uh, teach this cat to read your name and print that name to the terminal or to the screen. So in order to do that, obviously we need to first write a flowchart. 
So in the first element of the flowchart, you start, and then we have to do an input because we have to read our name. So it say read your name input. After that, we have to print that. Finally, it's so. So it's very simple. Start, read your name, print it, stop. So this symbol represents input, this symbol represents output. So this is start and this is stop. So what is the problem we're going to solve? The problem is teaching the head to read your name and print it back. Right. So when you convert that flowchart to the instructions, using this scratch visualized programming language. So first of all, start. This is start. When the flag click, the program will start. And then there is an instruction, in the scratch say ask. So in this ask, you can ask something. So what we ask here, what is your name? And then we wait until the user enter the input or otherwise until the user enter its name. After he enter its, his name, that name will store in a memory or store in a variable called answer. Answer is a memory, memory location. Or answer is a variable. Variable is a label which we put it into a memory location. So whatever we type here will read and store in the variable called answer. So then we can say hello. We can then instead of say hello, now we can say else the system say answer. So then what happens? The data which read here and store in the answer will display on the screen for two seconds. So then stop. So this is our input then, this is our output. So start the program, take the input, print the output, stop. So let's see So how it goes on scratch. So this is only output. Now we want to uh, read some inputs. So for that, we want to ask something. Ask, what is your name? So R, then this is a variable. So we put that here. So then answer will go there. So let's run that. So then cat asks us, what is your name? So cat expect an input. So I type my name as an input. And cat read it and put output. So that's it. So input, output, and stop. So we solve that simple problem. Like that, we can move on. Let's take some other problem. Right, in my third problem, to introduce those flowcharts, I'm using those problems. In my third problem, what we have to do is read my name and then say hello to my name and print answer and stop. So previously we have in the, this particular flowchart, the previous flowchart, we had start, input, output and stop. What is additional here is the processing. processing. So what we process is add hello to the answer. So this is my answer is the name. I add name to the uh, hello, add name to the word hello, and then it say hello, Azun, or hello, Mimal, and so on. So that is my answer. Instead of just taking name as the answer, I do some processing to the input, and then print it into the output. So in order to solve this third problem, what we require is some processing. So the problem we're going to solve is write a program to read and say hello. So algorithm for that is start, 
free domain at hello printed store. So in the scratch, how do we do that? So we say start after clicking this flag and then read your name. And then I add hello to the name using an instruction called join. And that will pass to the same. And so, so then this is processing. So for example, so I can modify my scratch program now uh, using this join. So I take the answer here and say hello. I process it. And instead of hello Hansun here now, I put it here. So then it has start, input, processing, output, stop. Let's run. Then it asks what is your name? And say then it say hello Hansun after I execute that. Then if I type Nima, then it say hello Nima. So you see, this simple program then, has all basic kind of four, 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 four basic flowchart components: start, process, input, output, and stop. Five, no five, five, five things. Right. Now. Let's see about conditions. So the flowchart has this conditional symbol, check condition symbol. So how it looks like is in this symbol, we inside we write a condition. If that condition is satisfied, we say yes, two. If that condition is false, we say no or false. So using the conditional symbol, we can branch or we branch or divide the execution into two different sequences. Okay, in order to understand that, how these conditions works, let's take a different problem. So the problem four we are going to discuss is write a program to read temperature, read temperature, and print cool or hot. So if, if the temperature is less than 30, we must print cool, if the temperature is over 30, we should print hot. So if you want to do that, we have to first write a flow, flow chart. So that flow chart consists of, you see, start. So then we have to read the temperature, obviously, from the user. And we, then we need to check whether it's greater than 30 or less than 30. The condition we check is here, whether it's greater than 30. If it is greater than 30, if it is yes, our output is cool. If it is no or the false, our output is hot. So we read it, check whether the temperature is less than 30. If that yes, we print cool. If no, we print hot. And finally, it stops. So this particular flowchart has two branches. So we run the execution based on this condition. So this sequence or that sequence. So how do you then convert this flowchart into a program using Scratch? So when you do so, it's something look like that. We start our program and ask the temperature and then we check the condition. In order to do the condition checking, there is a visual code for if as block. So we say if and we put a condition, our condition is our answer greater than 30, then we print hot or we can have answer less than 30 if we want. So I use greater than 30. So if that's satisfied, then we say hot. If not, we say cool. So this is if or conditional block. So have, let's have a look how to do that. We need to use conditional block for if and else. 
So if has a condition, then satisfy, this sequence will execute. If that is not satisfied, this sequence will execute. So what is the condition? We need to get an answer, right? And need to check whether this answer is greater than or less than 30. So for that, we have to use this operator like that. So we want to use, say, greater than, then say 30, and test the answer here. Then we have if condition built, it say if answer is greater than 30, then what we need to tell here in track and drop, greater than 30, we need to tell what? So we don't need this. Uh, so we need to uh, get uh, this. Let's say this. And say what? Right? As we need to say Cool. Right? So start and instead of now our question is room temperature. So you may type the temperature. Let me check whether it's greater than 30. If so, I say what? If not, I say cool and then I do stop. So that's how we convert that flow charge into a simple program. So we run the program by clicking the arrow. It has a temperature, I type let's say 40, or it might say hot. So maybe then I type temperature 25, or it say cool. So you see, program take two different paths based on the condition. It's handled by the block called if else. So this is very important construct in the algorithms and the programming language, if else, conditional block. Right. Let's back to our slides. The next problem. Next problem what you are, I would like to solve is to read the temperature for five days and print the average of that. So, so far we did print the temperature and just print hot or cool. Now, I would like to read the temperature in five days or in other words, five times. And finally, in the average of this temperature. How do I do that? Can you write, a, can you draw a flow chart to source this? Let's try to understand how to build a flow chart to solve this simple problem. Obviously, flow chart start, start with start symbol. And I want to read the data. And also I want to store the data for five days. So in order to do that, I may need what we call it as two storages for the variables. So I name those as days and the total. Total will keep the total temperature and the days will keep how many days, like first day, second day, third day, and so on. So for that, I use this sequence or the processing symbol and then I do this too. And then I have to read temperature. The input symbol will tell us, read the temperature. After I read that, what I do, I add the temperature and store the value in the total. In the beginning, as you see, the value of the total is zero. 
In the first day, when I read the temperature and add it, let's say 40 degrees. So the 40 will be stored in the door. So in the beginning, it's the first day, then I increase that to the second. After that, what I have to do that, I have to repeat the same thing for five days. When you do repetition of the same set of instructions, we call it as iterations, or we call it as loops. So, so here, what we see is a loop. So how do I build the loop? After I increase the days by one, I check whether that days is less than or equal five. If not, if it is less than or equal five, it's repeat the same action, if not, it stops. Or if not, it goes the other path. So for example, I read the temperature of first day, and obviously, when I increase the day variable by one, it becomes two. So then two is less than five. And then it, yes, this conditional will return yes, or the true. Then it come back and read the temperature again. So that temperature will add to the total and the day count will increase by one and back to check the condition. The condition is still true, goes through the yes part and read the temperature of the third day. Then it add the temperature of the third day, increase the day count by one, then it less than five is still true, go back and read the temperature of the fourth day and add it and back here, it's still less than or equal five because day is now five and it goes through this part and read the temperature on the fifth day. And it comes here at the temperature and the day count will increase to six and comes here. So now this condition is not satisfied because this is six, and then it goes to this part. So in this part it says, divide the total by number of days, so then we get the average. So this is a processing, or sequence of instructions. So then that average will print to the south and stop. So that's how our simple algorithm look like. Start, set some variables, read input, process that, check the condition. If it's not, if satisfy the condition, repeat that until it's not satisfy the condition. So this is iteration. And finally stop. Finally do processing and print that value and stop. So that's how it looks like. So when you convert that algorithm into a scratch program, something look like in this visual blocks, we start the program and we set the variable called total to be zero first. And in the scratch has a construct or visual uh, uh, block called repeat. And there we can say how many times we want to repeat this set of sequence. So we want to repeat it for five days. So we say, repeat this set of sequence five days. What are the instructions we want to repeat? We want to repeat read temperature. And this is, we just display that temperature we read and add that to the total. So we will do it for five days. And after it complete five times in five days, so I divide that total by five and print the answer on the terminal or on the display and then stop. So let's have a look or let's define our scratch to do that. So we have this scratch program. So what we need is repeat until control. So we have repeat until control. We want to repeat our action 
for five days, which action we want to repeat? We want to repeat this action. Ask the room temperature and then enter the room temperature. Perhaps we want to print that. And then we want to add a variable or add a storage to store the temperature value. For that, uh, we want to create a variable, new variable. So I can create new variable called total. Right, this is my old variable. So I then has to set this total variable to zero at the beginning. For that, there is a construct called uh, set. This one. I say, here I say set, my variable is now total to zero at the beginning. After that, what I want to do is this, I move this down. I set the, not the my variable actually, I want to have a variable total where I created it, this one. And I want to get the, uh, sorry, I here not not like this. Don't need this. I I drop here. I say set total my variable I created here total to zero. Then I say repeat that. I don't need that. Repeat that five times. Ask the room temperature. And I just uh, print the answer. Uh, I print the, my answer. So this answer. This is total. My So then we enter something, it returns to the answer. Yes, it's answer two color one. Hence this one. Instead of us, I want to print the answer, ask the temperature and get the answer. Now I want to add this answer to the total. For that we want to get uh, uh, operator. Total operator. So for that I need to add answer to the total. Means I say answer and then variable total add them together. And then I need to set that to this, like so. I put this to total. Total set to be this. So I say set total to answer plus total. So I put it there. So ask the temperature and show it and add that to the total and store it in the total. So repeat it five times. After that, I need to kind of, in the flowchart you see, I need to kind of divide it into by five. So I take this say hello, I don't need this now. And then 
I have to tell yet the daughter now. That is my daughter. So I have to build the uh, operator like uh, I take now not addition, I take average total divide five and say this. So that is actually average. So then I print say average on the terminal or the display and say stop. Stop. Start. Set a total to zero. Five times three it and add that answer to the total and display total divide five and stop the program. So that's how I code it using Sketch. So I enter the temperature first day in display and then I enter the temperature of second day display and this is the temperature of third day and this is the fourth day and this is the temperature of fifth day. The average temperature is 30 day. So you see, so this consists of all parts which require this uh, algorithm. So what are the parts if I go back? Sequence, that is processing, iterations and selections. So we solve the problem using start this question. What we learned actually, we try we learn to draw or we learn to solve problems by developing algorithms or designing algorithms. So in order to design algorithms, we use only these three constructs, sequence, iteration, and selections. And we use the flow charting tool to visualize it. So in the flow chart, basic flow chart, it has six symbols, start, stop, process, and sequence. Process means sequence is process, decisions, or what we call condition, output, and input. So this thing, using these six symbols, we try to visualize it. So that's what we try to learn. So this is our simple first algorithm that is print our name. It only has start, print and stop. It's only input. So then we had the program which has input and output both. So it read the name and print that name. And then we had input, process and output. Input, process and output. After that we have start, input, condition. Based on the condition, we give two different outputs. And after that, we have a little complicated problem which has a, which has what we call it as iteration or loop. There we have start, some processing, input, processing, condition, repeat. So this will repeat. It's read and processing will repeat several times. So that is for it as iteration in programming. So iteration also for it as loops. So we do loop here and then after finish that loop, do some processing, output and stop. So that's it. Any program is something like that. So the program based on the different programming languages, we have different methods of building those, like sequence, conditions, iterations, and variables to store those there. So we will learn how to do that with C later on. In this first lecture, I just want to introduce flowcharts which have six symbols, and then to show you how to draw a simple flowchart based on the problems. So when you move on, you will learn how to do that with different, different problems. Okay, that's it. Our uh, this is first part. That's it. And that's...
stop. Uh, the lecture today or the first section of the lecture. So there I did the simple introduction to the flowchart by using five problems. There I introduced six symbols, start, stop, input, output, processing, and conditions. So using that, we could solve any computing problem. So you might be interested. And let's move on later on with other session to learn it. Thank you for listening so far.